Hello and welcome to Being Well, I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, this is where we explore the practical science of lasting well-being. And if you've listened before, welcome back. We've talked on this show about hundreds of ways that we can improve our well-being and be happier over time. But one of the hardest things to do isn't just to get happy, it's to stay happy, particularly in some reliable way as the events of life wash over us. Good events, experiences, and changes in our life circumstance tend to make us happier for a little while. And bad events, experiences, and changes in our life circumstances tend to make us unhappier for a while. But there's this funny feature of life where, over time, it can often feel like we're just regressing back to a kind of stable level of happiness that we carry with us. And that's what we're going to be exploring today. This is something known as hedonic adaptation, and I'm really excited that we're going to be delving into it. So to help us do that, I'm joined today, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, a best-selling author, and very happy to say that he's my dad. So dad, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing well, and I got a nice little hedonic bump from you saying that, and I'm seeing your face <laughs> as you say it, and I just want you to know that I'm profoundly happy that 34 and a half or so years ago, you stumbled into my life as mm. our son. And I know your mom would say the same thing. That's really yeah, true. Well, thank you so much, Dad. That's yeah. such like a sweet reflection to kind of start the show uh, with. And we've both been looking forward to this one. I started delving into some research for this episode a little while ago, and it's really been kind of sticking with me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the content. I'm excited to hear what your take on it is. But before we get into all that, a couple of quick reminders. First, if you've been enjoying the podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe to it on whatever platform you happen to be listening to it right now on. Also, if you'd like to support the show in other ways, we have a Patreon account. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for the cost of just a couple cups of coffee a month, maybe even less than that, if you live in the Bay Area like we do, you can support the show and you'll receive a bunch of bonuses in return. So to start the content of our episode, Dad, you want to let us know what hedonic adaptation is? Or maybe if you want to expand on it beyond what I already said in the introduction. There's a whole body of work here that people can look up. The essential finding that really got things going was that after major positive events in people's lives, such as winning a lottery, they tended to return after some months, maybe a year or so, back to whatever had been their prior kind of resting state of well-being. What did that actually mean? And then other people started looking into the impact of negative events that dragged people's well-being down and yet, after a year or two or something, they kind of adapted, let's say, to a really serious event like losing the function of their lower body in a, in a car accident. And what do you do now? So there was this notion that we basically have a kind of set point or an equilibrium thermostat setting, our happy stat, as it were. And, you know, the temperature might range a little teeny weeny bit around that 70 degrees Fahrenheit, let's suppose, but it doesn't tend to move very much. This mm -hmm. finding then prompted a whole kind of rebuttal from a the other side. Do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, that took different forms. One, yeah. it pointed out that the, that research was essentially about how people responded to events, and then it raised larger questions about what effect do circumstances such as your annual income or inheriting some money or moving to a different town, et cetera, et cetera. What what effects can those have? So that's just about events or the opposite being negative events. Additionally, there's a whole question of, well, let's suppose that events tend to have a fairly limited lasting effect, or there is this tendency to return to kind of the center of gravity of your basic mood. But what about internal practices? What about doing psychotherapy? Or what about addressing trauma in your life? Or what about deliberately cultivating various qualities, such as happiness, gratitude, grit. And there's a lot of evidence, actually, that people can change their resting state of well-being by lifting anxiety and depression, and further, that they can also, over time, lift their well-being in lasting ways through various psychological practices that are more positively oriented. So I'll just throw that in. The, the last thing I'll just say is the whole question of to what use? 
And to really be clear, as you and I often talk about, um, ideas are situated in a political context, a cultural context, and can be used in various ways. Ideas about, let's say, historically, people of color, women, children, uh, ideas about the actual benefits of improving people's life circumstances can be used for various political purposes, such that if there's a finding that improving people's financial circumstances doesn't seem to matter that much, well, that's a real justification for robber baron capitalism. You know, why sure, not yeah, totally, keep totally. making the rich richer yeah. if, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter if anything ever trickles down. A big part of this conversation is this sort of what's the point aspect that gets into it. Because if we just hedonically adapt, if it doesn't really matter what our life circumstances are, and it's just like some combination of genetics and a little bit of the effortful activity that we do in our life, but like, eh, who knows about that one? Really, that's a little woo-woo, right? A little positive psychology mumbo jumbo. Um, then like, what's the point of anything that we're doing here, of this podcast, of our books, all of it? So it's really, really this central question, right? Like, can we actually become happier or improve our well-being over time? And there's a lot of research in this territory, and some of the leading research has been done by somebody who we had the pleasure of having on the podcast. Her name is Sonia Lubomirsky, and it was great to speak with her because she applied so much nuance to her research. She found that happiness basically comes down to three factors. Like, we can break things into these three primary categories, which is a person's genetics, as you were saying, Dad, their happiness set point, in quotation marks. Then second, life circumstance. That's everything that happens to us, right? It's a very big category. And then third are intentional activities. So the uh, meditation that we do, listening to this podcast on your walk, uh, anything that you're doing kind of top down in your own mind to make yourself happier over time, that's in that third category. And we have no control over our genetics, as we know, or at the moment we have very little control over them. There's this little bit of epigenetic expression stuff you can get into, but it's pretty minor. We have sort of minimal control over our life circumstance in a lot of ways. A lot of stuff happens to us in the course of life that we really can't do a lot about. So then we get to that third category, intentional activities. And the big question here is, how much does that matter? Right? That's sort of the big hedonic treadmill question. How much does that matter? And what she found in her research was something really interesting. She found that roughly 50% of a person's happiness and life well-being comes down to their genetics. Just genetic predisposition. And we see that in a lot of different ways, including in research that suggests that for things like depression, about roughly half of a person's predilection for depression comes down to genetic factors of various kinds. So obviously, if you're chronically depressed because you have some imbalance genetically going on in your system, something physiological, that's going to have a big impact on how happy you are over the course of your life, right? It's going to be a major player. And then she found that about 40% of it comes down to what we do inside of our mind. She generally argues that, yes, there are things we can do, but we need to be really deliberate and effortful about them. And we're going to explore some of that in the later half of the episode. And if you run the math on that, you find that just 10% comes down to life circumstance. So that's everything from where you're born to the amount of money that you make. And this got a lot of pushback for a lot of different reasons. How could it just be 10%? And so she offered this really good clarification when she talked with us on the podcast, which is that it's 10% as long as you're basically doing all right already. And this becomes a very, very fraught conversation very rapidly, because what does basically all right mean? Um, what are the standards? At, at which point can people affect their circumstance in order to improve how happy they are versus what they do inside of their mind? And this created part of that big conversation that you're talking about, Dad, in terms of people's different responses to it and how those responses were influenced by their political perspective or how they viewed social good or whatever else. So that's kind of a little uh, wrap of some foundational research that's going to influence some of what we're talking about today. And I want to just kind of take a step back here really quick, Dad, and give you an opportunity to, to jump in, offer any commentary on this. That's an excellent summary of the research forest. And I want to add a couple of no nuances to your excellent account. W one nuance has to do with the so-called negativity bias. And I would refer people to a paper, and you'll probably put it in the show notes, the Patreon notes, called Beyond the Hedonic Treadmill. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is where extremely good researchers took a close look at the hedonic treadmill research 
and with respect, started to unpack it in various ways. And one of the things they did find is that uh, people took a lot longer to return to their baseline of well-being after disasters, after losing their legs, after financial breakdown, after losing a child, let's say. I just want to interject real quickly because this is such a critical thing that you're naming here. Where again, to just restate that, when positive change happens in our life, we return to baseline pretty quickly. But when negative change happens in our life, it takes a lot longer for us to come back to baseline. Great reset. Yeah. Second key point is that these general findings about the impact of heritable factors, ergo DNA, or general findings about you know 10% uh, effect of um, circumstances, those at best are the averages across the whole population. This is also a great point, yeah. Yeah, and it's routine that we have to be very careful about the ways in which language suddenly makes us generalize to every individual member of the class. Now, every individual member of the class of water molecules is identical, but <laughs> not but true. But humans don't work that way. Yeah, totally. Yeah, for, like people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so to unpack part of what you're saying here, Dad, there are people where their life circumstances are enormously impactful on their lives. 100%, and it goes both ways, right? For every person whose life was radically changed for the worse by a single event, some kind of abuse they experienced, a single event, flip the other way, there are people whose lives were changed for the better because often some single person opened a door for them. Yeah, And that totally. door opening made all the difference in the world, even though, yeah. of course, after that, yep. they had to earn their own way. So that's the thing. And then the last thing I just want to say a little bit is that if you look back on the history of the discourse around nature versus nurture, because we're kind of talking about nature being that which is heritable and quote unquote nurture being everything else. When I look back at it, the early estimates of the percentage on average of the impact of heritable factors, that which we inherit through DNA from our parents, as well as, let's suppose, epi the epigenetic package that we also tend to inherit from our parents too, right? Um, the estimates of how big that factor is, how much that matters, have been steadily chipped away at as people understand things more deeply. The, the gold standard for that are identical twins raised in separate environments. So you're controlling for en environmental effects and you're left with what's heritable. But it's really important to appreciate that a lot of those studies on identical twins in different environments limited the variance of those environments because twins were adopted into middle class, upper middle class, and wealthy families, which immediately reduced the impact of negative environments and so forth. So me, you know, I'm not exactly sure what that number is on average. Um, you know, a re recurring finding is that roughly a third of the variance in adult characteristics over the lifespan is clearly baked into heritable factors. Maybe it's a little more, but I'm going to keep kind of holding out <laughs> for the low end <laughs> of that view. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> because you know, out of caution and also yeah. out of a kind of politically liberal view, yeah, but also yeah. because I just don't, I just ain't going to bet against the human heart. Yeah, and, and that's, to your point, very consistent with your worldview here. <laughs> yeah, right. And I and I think that one of the things <laughs> that we could it. all, absolutely, absolutely, that we could all be Work honest about here. for you, growing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm happy that I turned out the way that that's I right, did. Got, right, some right. great dream, got some great genes, got some great nurturance, clearly. I'm, right. I'm happy as a clam. Right. But like, I, I think that it's really important to take a step back here every once in a while and be honest with ourselves about our own biases. Like, I want to believe in a non-deterministic world. I, I am, I am, I'm just honest about it. Like, oh, yeah. that is what I want to believe in, that <laughs> we can too. change and grow over time. <laughs> so you are getting information on this podcast from two people who want to believe that. So, you know, we can be frank about that. And your mileage may vary, all of this good stuff. If you listen to something else from somebody who's like a real hardcore genetics are destiny person. That tends to go down to your point, Dad, some like pretty dangerous rabbit holes historically. That's yeah. a whole other podcast, but you just want to be careful with that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to name that. Also, as a quick point that you made, because you were talking about um, these twin studies, which are kind of the gold standard in this territory, these big uh, genetically identical twin studies. A difficulty with studying twins is that there are such complex interactions between our genetics and the environment. 
So let's say that you have genetically identical twins. Well, guess what? They look very similar. People react to people frequently based almost entirely on how they look. The world will respond to them in relatively consistent ways, and they might be advantaged or disadvantaged based on that in this kind of way where it's like, okay, is that genetics or is that environment? Or is it the environment responding to genetics? Like, what is that? So it gets very difficult to unpack the details of this stuff uh, in the research literature sometimes, which is why it's such kind of a fraught question. But okay, all that said, quick thing on money, because money <laughs> I is- I want to hear the Pink Floyd soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, my, <laughs> if we had the rights for it, I would totally drop it into the background here. But I think that that's probably above our production budget to get to, you know, some rights from Pink Floyd. But okay, so let's take a look at money because money is a kind of clean way to study hedonic adaptation, right? You get more money, your life circumstance improves. Does your happiness go up or does it stay kind of the same? And to give an example of some of the complexities here, there was a very famous piece of research done by Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel laureate, and Angus Deaton, published in 2010, that found that while making more money did improve what they called life evaluation, it decoupled from what they referred to as emotional well-being around $75,000 in the United States. People who made a lot more than that increasingly evaluated themselves as having very successful lives, very high in life evaluation. But more money didn't necessarily improve their overall emotional well-being. In other words, they didn't get much happier. They adapted to their circumstances. And we can see examples of this in our own life that give that finding maybe a little bit of credibility. You know, you, you get a new gizmo, you enjoy it for a little while, but after you've got it for a week or a month or a year, you just kind of stop noticing its positive impact on your life. I remember the first time that um, I got a smartphone that I've had for a couple of years. I was so into it. It had so many cool features that I wasn't used to having in a phone. And these days I hardly notice it at all. So, okay, that's, you know, there's some credibility there. This research was a huge deal. Many a money doesn't buy happiness Instagram image was made. There were a lot of takes about how people should just kind of stop whining about not having enough money, instead focus on doing their own work to become happier. And then as often happens in research, particularly what I'll refer to as soft science research, like the social sciences, psychology, and so on. A study came out just last year that completely pushed back on the work done by Kahneman and Deaton. And this was research from Matthew Killingsworth. He's a professor, I believe, at Warden, um, which used a pretty innovative approach where it did this real-time reporting system. You, I think it was app-based. I could be wrong about that, but I think that that's what it was where he was able to measure people's moment-to-moment -moment happiness based off of self-report. It had a huge sample size and found that happiness continues to rise linearly as people make more money, even considerably above $80,000, which I think was the inflation-adjusted number. In other words, there wasn't so much adaptation. It just kind of made people happier to have more. And what you see there is you see two studies studying the same thing, separated by 10 years, separated by methodology, and finding radically different results. Um, and I think that it just kind of illustrates how challenging it is to do research in this territory to start with. Like, people who are trying to do good work can still come to findings that are later challenged by, by other good work. Oh, there's so much in that. Another piece of it is that I'm familiar with the instruments that are used to mm -hmm. assess yeah. subjective well-being or life mm -hmm. satisfaction, these two basic measures. Yeah. There are also some called subjective happiness. And I've used them in a study. We actually recently got published, a Journal of Positive Psychology, learning yeah. to learn from, Ooh. Ooh, yeah. learning to learn from positive experiences. Everybody should immediately go to that study, click the links. and But anyway, <laughs> uh, these are typically five or seven item items on what's called a Likert scale that range from... Uh, totally disagree to totally agree or some version of that or range from never to always, but it's just seven items. It would be a little bit like assessing people's blood pressure with just seven steps on some kind of a scale. So one to seven, how's your blood pressure, which would leave out a tremendous amount of important nuance. And you can imagine other examples of that. So just because the available instruments cannot yet detect subtle increments of improvement 
doesn't mean they don't exist. So that that's an important point. And I think another really important point and, and kind of where we're going is, is to appreciate that circumstances really matter. I know you're going to say a little more about the ways in which in the wealthiest country in the world, many people's circumstances are far, far, far from comfortable, let alone affluent. Uh, so circumstances matter. And a lot of what matters, I think, clearly as a major factor is the attitude that people have. I know people who make $500,000 a year who are really stressed and feel like they don't have enough money. And I know people who make a lot less than that, including in other countries in the world, who, who feel really content. They're really happy, you know? So we'll, we'll get more into this, I'm sure. Just how do you feel about what you've got? And also, what are you doing inside your own mind routinely to cultivate traits of happiness and well-being and the factors of happiness and well-being. Yeah, we've spent a lot of time here doing kind of some backgrounding on this topic, and I do think that it's really important backgrounding, which is why we're talking about it so much. But I also want to get to kind of the how-to section. Yeah, You know, if we are going to actually, um, particularly in terms of what I focus on, keep on feeling good about the good things that we have in our life, mm-hmm. rather than just kind of getting used to them, letting them flow through us, like you like to say, Dad, like water through a sieve. Yeah. How can we tighten up that net so we catch more of those good experiences, or, or just keep on paying attention to the fact that like, wow, I have this amazing phone that has more technology in it than anyone in their life ever experienced 30 years ago or whatever, like, yeah. whoa. But okay, so to kind of finish our little roundup here, my bottom line on it is that contentious, controversial topics and research like this tend to invite a lot of straw men. And it's really important to not get reductive or extreme here either way. I think that absolutely there is some diminishing return on the extent to which money buys happiness. I don't know if I would experience a meaningful difference in my life if I went from making, I don't know, pick some absurd sum of money, like a million dollars a year to making $10 million a year. I, I suspect that the, the difference between those two things would start to fade into the background pretty rapidly. And at the same time, like obviously it matters a lot in that first $75,000, $80,000 a year. And my suspicion is that it actually matters a lot up to numbers that are considerably bigger than those. Um, because the reality is that money gives you the privilege to just not worry about certain things. Uh, polling shows that I think it's around 40% of Americans, just 40%, could pay an unexpected $1,000 expense. And just a quarter of Americans, 25%, say they they have anything resembling a real emergency fund. I think that we're just kidding ourselves here if we pretend that it is either all or not at all about the resources that are available to people in life. And broadly speaking, improving resources, improving access, improving healthcare, improving the amount of money that people make on average, Um, And particularly some serious conversations about redistribution of wealth, not just from an economic standpoint, but from a maximizing total happiness standpoint, are like very, very useful to have here. So here's kind of my general take. Yes, improving external conditions typically increases happiness. Yes, there are probably diminishing returns from improving those external conditions. And then we get to the really juicy stuff, which is that the brain is just very, very good at finding something else to want. So my suspicion is that there is some amount of hedonic adaptation that happens to us, as I kind of illustrated using my silly phone example. And we're going to mostly focus here, from here on out, on what we can do about this, and particularly how we can avoid adapting to the more positive changes that we experience in life. In other words, how can we keep feeling happy about the good things that happen to us? So what do you think about all that, Dad? Great summary. I thoroughly agree. and. I want to add a a type of event or circumstance distinct from money, which is other people. Yeah, there's tremendous research, you're quite aware of it, I'm sure, that probably the single major factor in determining longevity and and physical health over the lifespan, especially in the last 10% of it, speaking of the 10%, uh, are our relationships. And yeah, so if relationships, relationships totally. yeah, make a big difference. Yeah. Well, hello, that's not a hedonic treadmill. You know, throwing yeah. more good relationships in uh, doesn't just leave you in the same treadmill of well-being. It, it lifts your well-being. Um, so I think relationships are really important. And just at an incredibly human level, 
I don't know, as I get older, I, I guess I just pay more attention to the subtlety of how we land on each other. I just kind of imagine us as all walking around with golf shoes, with these metal spikes in the bottom, walking on each other's hearts. And can we tread lightly? Can we be really considerate, right? And just one little interaction with somebody casts a, a 12 hour shadow or 12 day shadow. You're still thinking about it. You're still wounded about it. You're still wincing. And you carry that stone. It's not like you suddenly ca ah. cast it loose because then you return to your happy go lucky treadmill of well being. You know, relationships really do matter. Yeah. Or, or sure, to your point here, Dad, um, that I'd want to emphasize because I think this is actually an excellent point as kind of a pushback against the pushback, if you will. Maybe it is just for two weeks. You know? Yeah. But you lived too. those two weeks. Those two weeks mattered to yeah. you. Those, those two weeks were real. Like at the end of the day, like, oh, maybe it just affects you for a month or a year. It's like, well, you only get so many of those and you want them to be good, right? So, so yeah, like it really matters what we do both to other people and inside our own minds, even if it is to an extent kind of transient because we're living those minutes too. I think uh, both of us are really saying it's an and. Yeah. Your genetics matters. Choose your grandparents well. I think you chose your grandparents <laughs> well for us, right? That matters. It's a great you know, job, yeah. You know, do what we can to float all mm -hmm. boats. Come mm -hmm. on, rising tide. And also what you do inside yourself to help yourself have beneficial experiences and especially internalize them. So you move from states to traits in lasting ways. That's really important too. Love it. Well, okay, so that was about half an hour of forest giving preamble. So if you made it this far, thank you for sticking with me and I will try to monologue less for the next half of the show. But um, I wanna start with the, what can we do about this part, Dad? Because that is literally your area of expertise. It's what you've spent an enormous amount of time thinking about. So, okay, first thing, you already kind of gave us one, which was try to improve the overall quality of your relationships. That can be a little tricky for some people. What are things that people can do inside of their own mind to push back on hedonic adaptation, to keep on enjoying what they already have? I think that it's clear that we should do the best we can for the most people in the most ways in their circumstances and in their physical well-being. How could anyone argue against that? And you and I, in our kind of parallel lives, we're each in our way really quite interested in how to promote social well-being at scale, and think about factors of that, as well as to promote physical health for people. So I just want to kind of check those boxes and say that's really, really important, both, you know, kind of improving what's good and also remedying what's bad and the combination of those two things. Super important. Second, it's really interesting to observe what are the mental factors uh, psychological strengths, psychological qualities that are volitionally available. Fancy way of saying it, you can do it yourself. I, I'm a real believer in DIY mental health. What are the factors that really, really make the most difference? And I want to stick my neck out and assert that I think that lots of things are in the mix, but I think there are three that make an enormous amount of difference themselves and they integrate other things that people might name. And I'll just say them here. And people can ask themselves, oh, how am I doing in that regard? First is loving. Warm-heartedness, positive relationships with others, social skills, internal skills that have to do with relationships so we don't walk around with rancor and ill will, so that we recover from injuries that have been done to us. We don't marinate in resentment all day long. Having a warm heart and a warm heart for yourself compassion for yourself, kindness for yourself, support for yourself. So, okay, question mark, loving, how's that working for you? And I should add in that, in the loving for me is a, an element of courage. You have, you bring heart to your life, you're wholehearted, all right? Second, knowing, are you aware? Are you mindful? Is there deepening awareness of your own interior, reaching all the way down into the basement? Are you aware? of the world around you or are, or are you moving through life with blinkered you know lenses and tunnel vision that doesn't really see the world around you can you sustain mindfulness steadily breath after breath after breath after breath you know loving and knowing and this is a really really important dimension um, and part of the knowing is the capacity to step back from your reactions 
and hold them in a space of awareness. So maybe it is happening. Maybe there is the pain uh, related to the injury or the thing that other people have done, but you're less triggered by it. You've got that shock absorber. Okay, so I've said two. I know you want to get in. What's your comment? What's your I'm comment? just going to jump in for one quick second here about the the knowing practice, which yeah. is essentially a, a practice of mindfulness. Yeah, broadly. Um, hedonic adaptation, broadly speaking, is what I like to call a sleepwalking process, hmm. where we're just sleepwalking through life. And because we just get used to it. And so it's something that happens when we are on autopilot, fundamentally, when we cease seeing the gems that are around us to steal your language, Dad. Um, when we cease recognizing the parts of our life that have improved, when we cease to see the aspects of ourselves that we have grown in positive ways over time, that's when the hedonic adaptation sets in. So if we can wake up to what's actually happening right now in this moment of our life, most of the time you're basically okay. And even fortunately, um, for many people who are in far less fortunate circumstances than we are, they're basically okay right now. Or at the very least, there are things that they can wake up to that are positive. And again, we gave 30 minutes of preamble on how important it is to deal with the other aspects of life, but we can do that alongside it. So that's why I think that the mindfulness portion of this, um, whether it's a formal meditation practice or that general attempt to move closer and closer and closer to your actual experience rather than your internal preoccupation as you're having an experience is such a huge part of the whole thing. That's fantastic. Great. Fantastic. So we're, we're talking here both about um, these three things. I'll get to the third in a second as aspects of your own well-being, because that's kind of our target. That's our outcome variable, as it were. We're talking about here, broadly stated. I mean, it's in the name of the show. What you going to do? Oh, right? yeah. You there you are. Got to well lean in. You know? Anyway. The third, so loving, knowing, growing. Learning, growing. You actually change. You actually move from states to traits. You're not just uh, kind of the, at the effect of whatever experiences you ha happen to be having at the time. So yeah, as long as the music's playing, as long as the paycheck's coming and people are loving your book and they're signing up for your Instagram account and you're doing your meditation app, as long as you're doing these things, you can keep feeling certain ways. But what happens when those um, supports, that scaffolding for your life, fall away for one reason or another? What's left inside? What have you actually developed in lasting ways? So loving, knowing, and growing. And if I could just put a plug in for growing, when I look back on 50 years of involvement in mental health, really, you know, what I see is what I could call growth 1.0. Growth 1.0, in which the model essentially is that individuals are like vessels into which various growth experiences are poured with the hope that some of it will stick. And mm, with mm -hmm. some intelligence about what gets poured in and how it gets poured in. That's growth point 1.0. Growth 2.0 actually respects people and trusts them and treats them as active agents in the growth process. Sure, as a vessel, have various experiences, listen to different teachings, let's do different practices, go to different therapies, read different books, great, 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 great. And meanwhile, what are you doing yourself as the vessel to maximize the internalization of that good that you've been receiving? That's growth 2.0, grounded in a growing understanding of positive neuropsychology, positive neuroplasticity rather. And so I'm, a, as you know, a big fan of that. That's been really central to my work. A lot of work's been done already on loving and knowing, and I think where there's a lot of opportunity is growing. So a person might ask themselves, how you doing? Loving, knowing, and growing. There's a lot of ways to talk about that last aspect. I mean, the most classic is talking about having a growth mindset, just the belief that you can grow and change in positive ways over time has been shown to have a real impact here. There's actually a really interesting piece of research that was done by, I think it's Bruce Heady, if I'm saying that correctly. I think this was 2008. Um, and what he found is that the goals that people have actually have an influence on how satisfied they become by life, like the way that their goals look and how they structure them. Um, people who have what are referred to as non-zero sum goals, this means that everyone benefits from the goal. This could include things like a commitment to family or friends or being involved socially or politically, tended to have or have higher life satisfaction. Essentially, they were happier at the end of the day. Whereas people who had what are sometimes referred to as zero-sum goals, this means like a commitment to their own individual success, 
career success, material gains, things like that, generally ended up less happier at the end of the day. They had lower life satisfaction. So how we orient ourselves to our own growth and development over time really does actually make a big difference here. Another part of that, it's, you know, it's Forrest Siren's song, I can't help myself, I have to do this. Uh, people who have an internal locus of control, they have an age, an orientation toward agency. They believe that they can change stuff is a huge factor in happiness. Yeah, yeah. I I actually think in some ways, you could you could almost argue that it's really the mother. It's the mother load. It's the what's there's this term when you make sourdough bread, like the mother dough or the mother batch of the oh i know what you're the sourdough craze of 2020 i i learned this term starter sourdough starter there's, yeah i know that it is there is sourdough starter but i don't know about the mother it's something the mother so. something or other. you could argue that the mother something or other just like you said is <laughs> internal locus of control that yeah i think it's yep. the start and yeah the start yeah, of everything the everything starts the effect there. and if you don't have that attitude you know, whatever happens, happens to you, but you're not the, you're not the engine of your own life. I would just add about growth mindset, wonderful work, Carol Dweck, big call out there. And again, growth mindset is good. A lot of people have one. I think it's good. The question is, do people have a growth toolkit? Do they actually know mm. how? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very Rick take on this. I like this. Do they have a growth toolkit? All right. Nice. Yeah. Okay, Dad, I see you. I like yeah. that. Yeah, there they are. They're the <laughs> vessel. And let's say they're the vessel that says, uh, oh, I have a growth mindset. Gotcha, I gotcha. can grow. But do you know what to do? Yeah. When you're having yeah. these experiences yeah. of gratitude or self-worth or release, do you know what to do? And so there's where I think about growth kit, You know, growth mindset, growth toolkit, your growth kit. How can you yourself be you know, on the growth 2.0. What's the opposite of a treadmill? Escalator. That's it. The escalator. The hedonic uh, the escalator. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that's it for us. The hedonic <laughs> escalator. Is that your next paper, Dad? Like creating the, the hedonic escalator? Yeah, that's it. And yeah. it doesn't just stop. It goes all the way up to the top of the mountain of awakening. Mm, wow. Can I show you wow, the book? That was, yeah, that, right oh here. My God, the book. That was profound. <laughs> and you just keep going <laughs> to infinity <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> okay. I'm going to cut it here because I want to keep us vaguely on track. Um, you said the G word there a second ago. You said gratitude. And so I'm going to use that as a jumping off here into the next, okay. what can you do to fight hedonic <laughs> adaptation, which is that research-based, the single most effective intervention for dealing with hedonic adaptation, in other words, still feeling good about stuff after you've had it for a while, after the good change happens to you, however you want to put it, is expressing gratitude. Um, really taking in the good parts of life, having moments where you look around and you just go, wow, many things are hard maybe, but this aspect of it is really fantastic. And this thing I really enjoy. We were talking before we turned on the recorder about sort of why we're doing this episode. And I was talking about my own experience where I, I had noticed just like a little mood frumpiness over the last couple of days for whatever reason, normal little fluctuations. And I, I woke up one day and I was kind of like, oh, you know, yesterday I didn't really get the things done that I wanted to get done. I was, and I just had this moment, probably about like 20, 30 minutes after waking up, where I just looked around at our beautiful little apartment that I have with my lovely partner and lovely San Rafael as I live this great life and I prepare my content for the podcast that I get to host with my dad. And I was just kind of like, what am I doing here? <laughs> and so it's just a little thing, but it's a moment where you kind of take a step back from, from the small self of whatever's going on in your immediate circumstance. And you can just look at the big picture and go like, wow, this is really great. Even the biggest possible picture, if it's meaningful to you, seeing the beauty in the universe, that connecting with, I don't know, connecting with God if you're a spiritual person, or seeing the um, the uniqueness of your own experience, really stepping back and being like, wow, having a human incarnation has a lot about it that's really tough, and a lot about it that can be really freaking great. Um, so however you approach that question, I just think that that's such a big part of this whole thing. A question for you, Forrest, and it's mm -hmm. an aspect mm -hmm. of the this whole notion of the treadmill, you know, the yeah. hamster wheel. Right? What's the point? Um, I, it makes me think about the actual how of permanent change. Like, and you could imagine different things where a person, let's say, was 
grew up in an, I'll make it up. They, they grew up in an environment as a kid where there were authority figures around them. Their, their stepdad was a real intense character, maybe, um, they had a coach in school, something. Now, as adults, they've uh, associated fearfulness with authority figures, even with authority figures who are big and kind of bossy, but are really not mean and punishing. And so it's unnecessary suffering. And so they they work on it and they get to a point, if they do, where literally they're dropped into an authority figure situation, even with an authority figure being kind of harsh or tough or critical. And internally, their needle does not move anymore. They are free of that afflictive reaction, to use a kind of traditional language. Right? So that would be an example of the hedonic escalator because they're no longer burdened by that. They've had a permanent lasting change. What are your thoughts about how permanent lasting change happens, including in your own experience? Oh, I wasn't really expecting that. That that question's not on our sheet, Dad. You're making me <laughs> ad lib this one. Um, wow, what a question. It's the money question in a lot of ways. Change that lasts, good change that lasts. In, in short, I think it probably really depends. And I think it's one of those things where we've had so many kind of psychological luminaries on the show where I've I've had the good fortune of being able to talk with, I think, like three people at this point who literally started a form of therapy that is now broadly practiced, which is freaking wild. And I think they would all have like slightly different answers to it. But I, I think that the first step is accepting that you have a problem mm -hmm. for everything. So mm -hmm. it all starts with recognition, like a yeah. self-awareness, recognition of the issue, acceptance that there is a problem that exists. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of this person, I think it's very hard to make that positive change if they don't have a moment where, to use the previous language that I used, where they don't wake up to the fact that there's a pattern. There's an issue, there's something that happened back in their developmental history, it's not their fault, but here they are and they wanna do something about it. So I think that that's a necessary first step is recognition. I think the necessary second step is believing that you have the ability to make a positive impact on your life. Agency, internal locus of control, call it what you will, necessary second step. And then I think that the third step is having experiences that contradict the painful story and then actively internalizing them. And we can get very mechanical about how does somebody do that? Do they have to be authentic experiences? Can they be experiences that are created inside of the person's mind? All of that stuff. However you do it, I think you need those three pieces. Because if you truly believe that every time you, um, you touch a stove, the stove is on, if you think it's always a hot stove, and you never touch a stove that's cool, you're not going to understand why people are telling you, hey, Forrest, uh, stoves aren't on all the time. You have to actually turn them on. You're going to be like, no, you're crazy. Every time I touch this thing, I get burnt. And that's why I think that those antidote experiences, which we've talked about um, on the podcast in the past, are such a necessary part of the whole thing. Those are the three necessary things. And we can do a lot of content as we have on how do you get more of those things or do better at those things or however you want to put it. Yeah, well, several points. Yeah. So first off, that was a phenomenal response on the volley. Mm. You took it on the Thank half you. volley. and well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and second, to make the point that yeah. the instances in which people do get a permanent shift, they're just no longer bothered by something. Uh, or they actually shift into a new way of being. They, they come into situations maybe with more self-confidence or more patience or with more openness to possibility, okay? Uh, those are examples of the hedonic escalator, not mm -hmm. the hedonic yeah. treadmill. Yeah. And it does happen. We see it happen all the time. Routinely, and it's the yeah. match because, you, let's say it a little differently, that escalator can go up or down. And there mm -hmm. are countless examples of where people had a thing that happened and forever after they would say, I've just been stuck there, or that really affected me, and I'm still carrying that ever since. You know, they've got taken down. So these are all counter examples to the premise of the hamster wheel that we're just always kind of stuck in the same place. Last point, I, I want to underline what you said about disconfirming experiences, antidote experiences. Uh, call out to Bruce Ecker. People should check out Bruce, who's one of the unheralded, unheralded 
people in psychotherapy who's also created a psychotherapy for us. We should definitely get Bruce on the show. Wonderful person. We'll talk more about it. But if people could check out Bruce Eckers' work, which has to do literally with how we can disrupt the reconsolidation in neural networks. Yeah, I've old, heard about this. Yeah, okay, of cool. old patterns, old habits, and stuff like yeah. that. And Bruce's work is fantastic. Uh, but it's just, but the premise of it, the fundamental requirement that Bruce emphasizes, including the uh, aspect of this that has to do with dopamine and the way your brain works, is that you have to have a uh, disruption of your prior expectation. There's like an expectation in my example that the authority figure will be really horrible to you. And as Bruce points out, or as the, the stove example, you think the stove will really burn you. You need to actually uh, blow up that old expectation. You need to disconfirm or antidote that previous belief. That's really a requirement. And it's very experiential, which I, I like because it's not about people telling you things you're now are supposed to believe, but you know for yourself that what you used to think was true is just not true. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. It's excellent work. And if we have an opportunity to, I would love to talk with them. Um, kind of related to that, there's really, really interesting research, again, talking about what can we do to kind of get off the hedonic treadmill, yeah. um, on the impact of various brain training exercises in terms of our ability to improve memory. Because a lot of what we're kind of sneakily talking about when we talk about hedonic adaptation is memory. Can we really compare our current circumstances to previous circumstances in accurate and lasting ways? Um, because if we're just kind of like constantly sleepwalking through the present moment, we're not actually experiencing it, but we're just kind of sleepwalking through it, then, well, whatever the way things are is kind of the way they've always been, and things have always been this good or this bad, and you know, I'm not going to get a lot of value out of the positive things that have happened to me or the ways in which I've changed in positive ways. Um, and particularly, really interesting thing, something that you've been doing a fair bit of these days, Dad, is exercise. <laughs> um, aerobic exercise can actually increase the volume of your hippocampus, which is one of the ways that we fight dementia. And in particular, the posterior hippocampus, which is a region of your brain, it's an important region for enhancing mood and improving memory. And there are a lot of brain trainings and memory exercises and things that you can find out there in the world. So I just want to highlight that there are actually things that we can deliberately do uh, to change the structure of the brain in positive ways that help us with some of these issues. I want to kind of bring up one thing. I know we're wrapping up here. And it just has to do, I think, with the intimacy of this question, which is, can we actually become less anxious? sad, depressed, and can we become actually happier, more at peace? Just really, what's, what are the real possibilities here? That's what we're really talking about. And we know we talk about it necessarily in a fairly conceptual way, but I think it's underneath it all, there's like this deep feeling. Um, I think of the title of one of the very best books I've ever read, uh, having to do with personal growth, What We May Be. What are the possibilities here? And if you look inside yourself, you just kind of watch your own mind, you can watch little ways that you nudge your own well-being up or down. You know, you go down the escalator or you go up the escalator, but it really does make a difference. And you, you really can notice that and you can pay attention to that and you can learn from that. And uh, partly, as you know, bias, we're going to be biased one way or another. I'm very biased toward efficacy. And I think you know, if over time we would think to ourselves, you know, I actually can learn to make spaghetti sauce better and better. I'm going to learn some things about making spaghetti sauce better and better. So, well, you are spaghetti sauce. Each of us is spaghetti sauce. Like if we can make spaghetti sauce better and better and better, why, why can't we make ourselves happier and happier and happier <laughs> too? <laughs> Oh man, I'm. Uh, there's a lot there. <laughs> I, think, I think one of these things is a little more complicated than the other, Dad. But I love the metaphor, and I'm glad that you. I'm glad you just ran with it there. You just, just straight ahead. Oh man, God, that's funny. I love that. It's the spaghetti sauce theory uh, <laughs> advocated by Rick Hansen. 
<laughs> that goes into the 2.0 vessel. Yeah, yeah, right. We we reshape the vessel. We fill it with spaghetti yeah. sauce. We call it a day. Yeah, the upgrade. Um, <laughs> as we're riding the escalator up to the ceiling, listening to Pink Floyd in the background. <laughs> and if you could do all that at the same time, you're probably able to get off the hedonic treadmill, <laughs> which is what we talked about today. I can't think of a better capper uh, to the episode than the spaghetti sauce theory of personal growth. Um, so <laughs> unless you have any final thoughts here, Dad, I think that's where it's, uh, we're going to leave it. Nope. All right. He's muzzling himself, which, which might be for the best. Um, no. Uh, so all jokes aside, I really enjoyed talking about this. I hope that everybody enjoyed listening to it. I thought that there was a lot here, even though we ended in levity, that was just like so deep and so important. And, and it's really critical to the podcast as a whole because hey, if hedonic adaptation is the be-all, end-all, then what the heck are we doing here anyway? So clearly that's not our position, which we articulated uh, pretty thoroughly on this episode. So today we talked about hedonic adaptation and how we can get off the hedonic treadmill. We covered a ton of information during today's episode, so I'm going to do my best here to move through it pretty quickly and make this summary at the end a real summary. To start with, we talked about what hedonic adaptation is. Hedonic adaptation, which is also known as the hedonic treadmill, is our process of habituation to positive and negative stimuli. Our level of happiness, our emotional well-being, tends to be relatively stable over time according to research. This means that although good events and bad events both happen to us, we tend to return to a stable baseline most of the time relatively briskly. As we gain good things in life, we get used to them. The new object is nice to have for a minute, but then we just kind of stop noticing it. And particularly, we adapt to positive changes in life circumstance more rapidly than we do to negative changes. But there's some research that even people who suffer horrible injuries return to a fairly stable level of happiness after just a few months. This research is really complicated, and it's been fairly controversial over time. There are a lot of different opinions and just a lot of ink that's been spilled in general over whether or not hedonic adaptation is a real thing, and if it is a real thing, how much of a real thing is it? Our general position on the show is that, yes, people absolutely adapt to their circumstances. Humans are remarkably resilient. And one of the things that we're resilient to, unfortunately, is positive change in our lives. And you can see this probably inside of your own experience. How much do you really notice some positive change that happened in your life over the last couple of years? For some people, the answer is going to be, wow, I really notice it every day. And that's great. More power to you. But for a lot of people, it's really easy for positive changes to just kind of blur into the background. We kind of just get used to that. I then did a roundup of the research in this territory. I'm going to summarize it very, very quickly here. There's a lot of research on happiness. Most of the research finds that most of what makes us happy comes down to three categories. First, your individual genetics. Genetics plays a huge role here. Second, the influence of life circumstance. That's all the stuff that happens to you and includes stuff like how much money do you make? And then third, what people do inside of their own minds or out in the world, their intentional activity. To dramatically oversimplify this whole territory, most reliable research finds that it's kind of 50-50 nature and nurture. Uh, Rick likes to slant a little bit toward the nurture side of things, which makes sense. He's got a positive psychology background, and he's focused most of his work on what people can do inside of their minds to make themselves happier over time. And we see this happen all the time, right? People really do heal old wounds. They really do become more caring and compassionate. They really do change in positive ways. So we spent the rest of the episode talking about how we change in positive ways. What can we actually do to get off the hedonic treadmill and, as Rick liked to put it, onto the hedonic escalator? First things first, you have to put the work in. There's a takeaway that's hidden in plain sight to that little pie chart I gave earlier where there's some life circumstance and some genetics and some intentional activity. Well, intentional activity means intention. It means that you are trying to do something deliberately. So if you're not willing to put the work in to actually pursue greater happiness, greater well-being over time, well, it's not going to just happen to you magically most of the time. Second, mindful awareness. Waking up to what's really happening in the moment and taking in the good events of life as they happen. To give a very silly little example of this, I got a coffee cup recently. It's a 10 
$15 insulated cup. If you're watching the video, I'm holding it up right now. It's from, you know, Verve Coffee to give them a plug, um, which is a wonderful little roastery that I think is down in Santa Cruz or something like that. It's a lovely little insulated cup. It's not a game changer to my life. But every morning when I've been making my coffee, I've been really kind of going out of my way to practice with like, wow, I really like this cup. I really like that my coffee stays the temperature that I like it at. Huh, how great is this? And what I've noticed is that if anything, my fondness for this cup has increased over time as opposed to me kind of adapting to it being in my life. And obviously that is a very minor example of this, but it's just a small thing that maybe you can find a uh, parallel for in your life where you can do a deliberate practice of mindful awareness that also incorporates gratitude. Because the big game changer in this territory, research has shown, is gratitude. It is the single best way to get off the hedonic treadmill. An aspect of gratitude that we didn't talk about much during the body of the show, but that I want to kind of get in here at the end, is the idea of social comparison. Because most of the time, through social media and otherwise, we compare up. Uh, we see all of the stuff that we don't have. We see how many followers somebody else has that we want to have. We see the cool car that we want to have. We have a friend who's bragging about their whatever at dinner and makes us feel kind of bad about ourselves. All of that, that's normally what happens with comparison. We compare up. And we fight this comparison with gratitude. And maybe even to an extent with an appreciation for what we do have, an appreciation for what we've cultivated inside of ourselves, an appreciation for what we have externally, if that's meaningful for you, an appreciation for the meaningful relationships that we've developed over time that maybe other people haven't developed. Then I mentioned various brain training exercises. The brain has a big influence on how happy we are. And it turns out that there are some exercises that we can do deliberately in order to change the structure and function of the brain over time. This includes particularly memory-related exercises because part of hedonic adaptation is sort of maladaptive memory function. We just don't see the ways in which things have changed positively for us. And there are a ton of exercises that you can find out there aimed at that. Then finally, we can change how we orient toward and think about both ourselves and the world. And the most important part of this, at least in my opinion, is everything that people say about having a growth mindset. Um, do you believe that you are a fixed point or do you think that you are a changing line that moves through space? Because if you don't believe firmly inside of yourself that you really can grow and change for the better over time, of course you're going to be trapped where you are right now. It's not all that you need, but it is a completely critical first step in this process. And that's part of why I harp on agency during almost every podcast episode. I just think that it is where all of this stuff starts. So that's it for today's episode. It was a long one today. We moved through a ton of material. If you made it to this point, thank you so much for sticking with us. I really appreciate it. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please take a moment to subscribe to it through the platform that you're listening to it on right now or some other platform if you prefer a different one most of the time. And also, if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for the cost of just a couple dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return. We talked about gratitude during this show a fair amount. And one of the things that I'm really grateful for these days is that there are so many people who take the time out of their lives to listen to the episode. Uh, it really just means a lot to me and I truly appreciate it. So until next time, thanks for listening and we'll talk to you soon.